So, um, yeah, I'm going to get straight into it. Um, so here's a, a hydroelectric dam. Uh, and in order to function properly, it has uh, permanently transformed uh, the local environment, creating a, a niche that is neither natural or artificial. So let's define uh, a niche as a portion of the natural world which has been altered to provide an adequate environment for a technical artifact. Here's an electric grid. It covers a country connected to uh, hundreds of thousands of technical artifacts, computers, lights, buildings, uh, so on. Um, many of the artifacts are completely dependent on the cycle of alternating current that the grid provides. The grid is their niche. Um, here is a diagram of a heat pump fed with electricity. A heat pump can extract heat from one space and dump it somewhere else, moving it uphill from a cold place to a hot place. In summertime, you could say that using a heat pump is like staying afloat by bailing your sinking boat out uh, with a bucket. To stay cool, you dump heat it out into the street, on top of the roof, or deep down underground. A heat pump, otherwise known as a chiller when it's in that mode, is arguably the essential component of any HVAC system. The HVAC systems can be elaborated with all sorts of kit for moving, filtering, humidifying, dehumidifying, and mixing air and recovering heat from it. But the heat pump is the only technical artifact that does the magic thing of extracting heat from one place and dumping it somewhere warmer. Uh, everywhere else in the universe, heat tends to spread out spontaneously in the other direction from hot to cold. Everywhere else except inside a heat pump. Uh, notice that the heat pump operates in communication with four niches. There is the grid that provides it with the electricity to do work, to move that heat, heat uphill. Uh, and the, there are the other su uh, subsystems of HVAC technology, and there, are, there is the source from which it takes heat, and the sink to which it dumps heat, which can be either the interior or the exterior of your building, depending on what mode the heat pump is working, heating or cooling. So remember, a niche is a natural environment that is altered by technology so that technology can function uh, properly. Um, as heat pump technology evolves, it must adapt to these four uh, niches, but the niches must also adapt to the heat pump. And the demands of this reciprocal adaptation are often at odds with the demands and desires of occupants and the contingencies of, of construction projects. Somehow, in our failure to reconcile the conflicts of reciprocal adaptation, we end up with this, uh, the cluster duct. The cluster duct is fragmented far from, and far from integration. The processes are sequentially related, but they are rarely interdependent. Rem Koolas called it the surrendered space, here is one of um, his installations from his exhibition at the 2014 uh, Venice Biennale. According to Kulas, he says, uh, the ceiling used to be a decorative, a symbolic plane, a place invested in uh, intense uh, iconography. Now it has become an entire factory of equipment that enables us to exist, a space so deep that it begins to compete with the architecture. It is a domain over which architects have lost all control, a zone surrendered to other professions. So I think uh, Kulas is uh, somewhat right here. He, uh, changes are happening uh, in architecture, and these changes are being driven by technology in the hands of a fragmented pack of specialists who are not interested in architecture with a, a capital A. Uh, but I think he misses one thing. There's uh, one important thing that we should remember. Uh, the specialists are not in control of it either. Right? Uh, no single person is. That's why I prefer to call it a cluster duct. Uh, because it is the result of human actions, but not necessarily of, of human design. The cluster duct is a reflection of the construction industry more than it is a reflection of what is possible in terms of orchestrating physical uh, phenomena. It reveals a series of analytical separations of realities which exist in the minds of industry actors and the organization of the supply chain. But these analytical separations do not always correspond with the physical potentialities of the architectural milieu. So now I'm going to give you an example of how 
uh, the analytical separations used to chunk technology into conceptual pieces do not always correspond with the reality of the physical continuum uh, um, of material reality. And the example is a kind of material structure that I've been developing for, for envelopes. Uh, so I'll start from here. Uh, as we, uh, with the observation, as we know that modern enclosures are designed as, as insulators with walls made from layers of different materials. But I'm going to argue now that it might be better to design them as heat exchangers using one base material uh, that can perform uh, several functions. So for that, I need to explain what heat exchangers are and delve into this black box. Uh, so heat exchangers are the interface between heat pumps and their thermodynamic uh, niches, uh, the heat sources and the heat sinks. Right? Uh, so here are some different kinds. Uh, what do they do exactly? Well, they pass heat from one fluid to another while keeping those fluids uh, physically separate so they do not mix. Yeah, or in technical jargon, what they do is they decouple heat flow from mass flow, mass flow being the, the flow of those fluids or, or gas. Right? And the fluid can be any kind of medium. It could be water, refrigerant, air, gas, blood, chocolate. It doesn't matter what the fluid is so long as it can flow and so long as it can carry heat. You can think of heat exchangers as a kind of, extend, of extended surface, right? and they could be fins, pins, bumps, plates, corrugates, pipes, channels, etc. If you unwrapped the vasculature of a leaf or the veins and arteries under your skin, you'd find a very large surface area packed into a very small volume, which is a perfect example of a, an extended uh, surface. Uh, porous materials can be treated as, as extended surfaces. And they can be used as heat exchangers uh, so long as two conditions are, are, are met. Right? So I'm going to explain these two conditions and we're going to come back to them at the, at the end of this segment. So the first condition is that the pores must be open um, for the fluid to pass through, whether it's water, gas, air, chocolate, etc. And second, uh, the second condition is that before the porous material can pass heat to the fluid, the material must first receive heat from somewhere else. Right? Um, so the material structure I'm showing you now it combines two kinds of heat exchangers, uh, vascular surfaces and porous materials to create a new uh, schema um, for, for building envelopes. Um, and we'll get to that in a bit, but first um, I have to say some more things about how heat exchangers are typically used in buildings. So in a, in a low en energy building, you'll probably find an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. And the basic idea is that you super uh, insulate the building and basically wrap it up in a plastic bag uh, so that it's uh, as, as much as possible isolated from the external environment. And then you have um, a series of ductworks inside that building and that moves heated air into the spaces uh, where, it needs, uh, where it needs that warmth. And then any waste heat um, is taken up uh, back into that cluster duct system. And on its way out, uh, it's, that, it's that arrow there spiraling. On, on its way out, before it exits outside that stale air, it comes in contact uh, with a heat exchanger. And that heat exchanger puts that mass flow, that air mass flow, in thermal contact with a fresh air supply. Okay? And so the fresh air passes its heat to, sorry, the stale air passes its heat to the uh, cooler, fresh air. Okay? But their streams do not mix. All right? So it means you could preheat incoming air with energy that would otherwise be lost to the environment. Okay? And the spiral there is depicting basically you need a, a prolonged contact time between the two streams to be able to pass that uh, heat. So there are many types of heat exchangers and many ways of uh, applying them, but out of habit when it comes to building design, we tend to stick to two rules, two rules that I want to challenge. Um, first, we keep heat exchangers separate from the architecture of buildings. And second, the heat exchangers tend to be small compared to the spaces they regulate thermally. They are the coils inside an air handling unit installed on the roof of a shopping mall, the coils inside an air conditioning unit sandwiched in the sash window of a rented office space, 
or the old radiator wedged behind a sofa in a suburban home. Uh, so what's so significant about their size? Well, to have any effect, a smaller heat exchanger must run at very hot or very cold temperatures. But for larger heat exchangers, tepid or moderate temperatures would be fine for the um, thermal control fluid. So long as the heat exchanger had good contact with the occupants in, let's call it this interior bath. And this is important because perfectly tepid water, or perfectly tepid water at, say, room temperature, would mean ultimately burning less fossil fuels. We burn gas to heat our radiators while our chillers run on electricity, which is normally generated using fossil fuels. But if our heat exchangers were larger and more integral uh, to our spaces, we could more efficiently use the free but low quality heat from, say, the sun, the sky, or the ground. In essence, I'm giving you a common sense view of what the second law of thermodynamics has to tell us about uh, building design. The problem is that low quality sources of heat are difficult to exploit because they are so dispersed in the environment. The design challenge is like getting rich by collecting the spare change behind every sofa or running for president with small campaign donations from every citizen. Here's an example of a large heat exchanger that is almost integral uh, to the architecture. I developed it um, with colleagues while working at Foster, Foster and Partners uh, for the Bloomberg headquarters in London, uh, which was completed recently. It's a radiant panel and it also can, um, controls lighting uh, and acoustics. So copper pipes are integrated into the, into the spirals, which here are extruded aluminum, uh, sort of twisted and spiraled. And the, what it's doing here is that it, normally radiant ceilings are uh, in a flat surface and that, so that surface area of exchange is limited. What we do by spiraling it here is increase the effective surface area by, by threefold. Right? And so it means that we can get um, the same amount of cooling uh, but with tepid temperature, tepid water instead of cold water. Right? because the equation for cooling is, 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 is proportional to the temperature difference and the surface area, okay? And this has certain knock-on effects, right? So um, it obviates the need for um, a, a chiller in many, uh, in many situations, and uh, also it meant we could ventilate the building naturally without fear of dripping condensation, which is often a, a, a limitation. Uh, with, with radiant cooling. Um, so this is uh, what it looks like now after a, a second design uh, iteration during uh, installation last year. After I um, left, the team had to uh, reduce the complexity of the design to, to lower the cost, and I, I think the uh, output is better in many respects. Um, so the surface area is slightly less, but the, we, we were far, by far exceeding the, the cooling target anyway, um, and the principles are the same. So here's um, another kind of heat exchanger. It's a porous blade for a, um, a gas turbine engine. Right? Um, the paper that I'm showing there gives a method to optimize the size and the spacing of the cooling channels in, in that blade. Right? And the idea is that you would flood the inside of this blade with water or air at high pressure. And as the fluid or gas transpires through the pores, it prevents the blade from overheating. And this is very important, of course, because um, keeping the blades cool um, is, it means that they don't expand uh, while the gas turbine is whizzing around, and so they don't encroach the encasement uh, and lead to an explosion sort of midair in your, in your aeroplane or in your gas turbine engine for generating electricity. All right. Anyway, for the last um, three years or so, I've been thinking about what we could learn from that method outline in that paper by um, uh, a, a guy called uh, um, Adrian Bejan and, and some of his colleagues. Specifically, I've been asking if we can apply the method to design a new kind of um, building envelope. I'll explain with this illustration. Um, so if we zoom in to start with what the, I guess the thermal phenomenology of, of, an, of a typical um, insulated wall. So it's um, inside is warm and outside is cold, and heat, like the, everywhere else in the universe, um, flows from hot to cold, from inside to out. 
Um, in reality, it's very difficult to get a completely impermeable um, envelope. So let's look at this rogue pore inside the, um, the envelope there and, and think about the thermal exchanges happening there. So the uh, fresh air, let's say, is being pushed in by, let's say, the wind. Uh, you get a, a spout of air going through that rogue pore. And because heat always moves from hot to cold, some of the heat going out is rerouted to that cold uh, stream coming in. So we recover some heat that would otherwise be lost, right? Some of the heat is rerouted, okay? And so by the time that fresh air comes in, it is slightly pre-warmed. It's slightly warmer than when it first entered. Okay, so the game here is, well, what if we could optimize the pores in that material so that we completely, uh, so we find the balance between those two energy streams. Uh, the, heat, um, uh, the heat in conduction flowing through the material in one direction and the heat carrying capacity of the airstream going in the opposite direction. So in a sense, can we, can we optimize the pores so that when the air comes in, it steals all the heat away all right, and puts it back into the room, fit the material to the flow. So um, it's a sort of Goldilocks uh, scenario. If the holes are too big, then um, the air um, will not have enough contact with the material to be pre-warmed uh, sufficiently. If the um, holes are too small, uh, yes, you would get a lot of heat recovery, but then you'd have a very large pressure differential to overcome. So you'd have to have a, a very large uh, fan to suck through the air or a huge chimney to pull through the air by, by buoyancy ventilation. But there's this moment where it's just right, where given, um, say, a fixed pressure differential that you want to aim for and how much heat you want to recover and a material that you're working with, you can optimize the, the pores and, and get the desired amount of heat recovery. Um, and so they, um, this is one of the correlations that, that the, uh, the guys in that paper uh, formulated and tested with um, simulations, uh, mostly for the context of aerospace engineering. Okay, but um, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Grinham and I, um, we made some samples to, to test uh, the theory and see if it would work uh, for uh, building envelope uh, materials and, and in, that, in the building envelope um, environment. So the samples here are, are made of, of glass, concrete, and wood, standard construction materials. And this was important for us and is important for us uh, for a simple reason, um, that it takes many tons of materials um, to make a building, which means that um, construction materials per unit mass must be very cheap, right? Um, most structural materials cost about a dollar per kilogram, which means that in terms of materials value, the construction industry is on par really with the packaging industry uh, rather than, say, uh, the sports industry. Yeah. Um, so you heard it right, uh, pound for pound, making buildings costs about as much as making um, paper cups, plastic forks, and, and tin foil. It's, uh, that's not the same as sort of real estate and the value added on there, but to make buildings pound for pound, it's, it's sort of at that level. So you, that's the reason we don't have high-tech materials in, in construction, right? Or if you do have high-tech materials, they have to do a lot of things uh, to sort of displace all the volume of those cheap materials. Yeah. There has to be sort of this extreme integration of functions. Anyway, so back to the science. So um, Bejan and his colleagues developed these two correlations. Um, I won't go into detail with them, but the first one tells you, like, uh, basically, it tells you the heat exchange going, th uh, the, the amount of heat exchange through optimal designs. And the second one tells you well, how to optimize the geometry uh, to achieve that um, maximum heat exchange. All right. um, and you have properties there like um, the porosity, the conductivity of the material, and uh, the pressure, and the temperature difference across. All right. Um, so they developed these, uh, the, 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 the structure of these equations by analytical reasoning and then they um, tested the validity of the equations using like thousands of numerical simulations and they correlated um, them to the outputs of those simulations and they correlated by, by uh, basically 
tweaking these exponents until, until the, the, the prediction curve matched uh, the data of, of the human cross simulations. That's what it means by calibrating. But no one in the literature had put the correlations to the test with physical experiments, which is where we came in. And despite the theoret solid theoretical basis, it was not obvious that the correlations would apply to building envelopes. Uh, after all, the um, driving pressures and temperature differences in a building are much lower than those experienced by turbine blades and pieces of not yet invented um, aerospace technology. So we tested the theory and fabricated the samples, um, attached uh, millifluidic um, panels to them, as you can see on the, on the top uh, right there, and housed them in this open face styrofoam enclosure, uh, attached a fan blower to the back so we could suck air through, and we measured the, uh, the heat transfer across the samples, and we were able to see how much um, heat was recovered by the airstream and whether or not it fit. Uh, I won't go into detail there, but basically, in short, that line represents the prediction made by Beijan et al. And th that is, um, the dots there are, are experimental uh, data. It, the data fit the, um, the correlation, uh, which is big. So it means, basically, that this correlation normally used for turbine blade design can, in principle, be used for, for building envelope uh, design in the way that I've proposed. And because the correlation is so general, we can use it for any base material and to achieve any heat exchange efficiency. All right. We could make one out of chocolate if we wanted to, or you know, whatever. What's the difference between the wood and the steel and the plastic? The, the, wood, the wood there in this particular configuration is, um, is, could, it, it is recovering more heat. So the, the, more, the higher up you go that slope, the, the more heat is being recovered, right? Uh, so I think the heat, heat recovery efficiencies for the, ones were, uh, for the wood ones were 98% and above, whereas the, the glass and the concrete ones were, um, I'm so glad you asked this question, were um, lower at about uh, 60%. But that's, that wasn't the point of the experiment. We, we know the variables, so I'm gonna move away from the mic, we know the variables here, so if we wanted to make um, concrete samples or glass samples that moved up the slope, we would just have to tweak um, the geometry in order to do that. So it's not a question of the um, insulative quality of the material itself? We, yeah, it, it's, um, it, so that is, um, the thermal conductivity of the material is one of the parameters. Right. To, and to, to compensate for, say, a high conductivity, we uh, fiddle around with the porosity, right, and to, to, to match, right? So like um, a wood one, for example, would be small channels at a low overall porosity, but then a concrete one, which is a high conductivity, would need uh, larger pores and at a higher porosity to be able to recover, for, to have more air coming through to recover the heat going in the opposite direction. Uh, this, this sort of depicts the generality of it there and how the the geometry morphs to the, um, the, the thermal conditions and the fact of its own conductivity. So the, the, the slender ones there are the low conductivity materials such as wood, and the, the fatter ones there are the higher conductivity uh, materials like, like metals. So that shows the, the, uh, how the ratio scale for one instance. And it's really, it, it, the, um, the low conductivity ones are so thin because um, heat cannot travel very far across the material. So it can't take a very large like detour. But the, um, the higher conductivity, in high, high conductivity materials, heat is freer to conduct through a large detour. So that's why you get the, the changes in ratio in geometry. Um, so the idea is that you, um, so to, you need to suck air in, right? And so you can do that by using a fan or natural, natural suction from, from a chimney. And as you increase the airflow, the conduction losses to the environment uh, reduce, so a kind of a dynamic U-value, if you would. And the essence of this idea has a history going back to the 1960s when engineers in Northern Europe um, first started to experiment in livestock buildings uh, by sucking fresh air through insulation materials in, in walls and ceilings. Uh, the Norwegian phrase, Modstromstak, highlighted the novelty of countercurrent heat exchange, while in German, Porenluftung alluded to the idea of breathing with ventilation through pores. And caught between concepts, 
uh, British researchers uh, later settled on the ambiguous term uh, dynamic insulation. Um, so, but the ins using insulation materials in this way proved uh, problematic. Um, initial experiments showed good agreement with theory, but later experiments gave inconclusive results and suggested some serious uh, limitations. And what, happened was, what would happen in these installations is that with increasing fresh air, the temperature of the interior surface tended to fall. Right? Uh, so, did the, so therefore did the portion of recovered heat in the envelope and the radiant temperature of the interior. Um, and so also did eventually research among, interest, uh, among uh, uh, researchers. So what was the problem? Here's where we get back to uh, the importance of the vascular surface. Um, so te technically speaking, dynamic insulation is a kind of heat exchanger. Uh, the network of pores passes heat to that incoming air. But remember that those conditions for the operation of, uh, of a heat exchanger, right? Um, before it can exchange heat, uh, the porous material must first receive heat from somewhere else first. Okay? Uh, and in a building with dynamic insulation, the porous material, uh, it's the porous material that has to receive heat from the room. Uh, and sources of heat um, include heaters, people, lights, and so on. And they pass, they pass on their heat to that interior surface by radiation or convection. So in other words, the rate of heat transfer from the room to the wall depends on the fluid dynamics of the room. Here I'm showing a Schrellen imaging uh, image revealing by uh, refraction of light the warm plumes rising off people. At the moment, this room is filled. Uh, you, you, are, you should consider yourself as being immersed in a, in, a, in a bath full of air. And your body is heating the air locally, and that air acts as a fluid, and it's rising up. So if I had special Schrellen goggles on, I could see this mushroom of warm air rising up from all of you, and it kind of stratifying at the, at the top there. We don't exist in empty space. We exist in, in a bath. Um, so uh, uh, what about the air coming into the room uh, from the pores? Uh, so what about the air coming in through, uh, into the room through the pores? Does it influence the fluid dynamics of the room at all? So according to the dynamic insulation literature in the past, it does not, but we suspect it otherwise, so we conducted a, an experiment using Schrelling imaging to take a proper look at what happens. And here you see the, the jets coming in, you see two things. You see, uh, before you saw a warm jet of air rising up the heated surface, and then uh, these are the jets of air coming in, and, and as, I, as we increase the airflow, you know, more and more turbulence uh, ensues. No one had looked at, at what happens at this boundary layer uh, previously. Um, so our hypothesis was that the incoming air pushes the room heat away from the wall much like uh, you have on an air hockey table, the, um, the jets push away the puck. And we can say, by analogy, the puck here is the heat sources uh, in the room. All right? And so it would cut off thermally uh, the heat sources from the room uh, from, from the wall, the, the, the porous heat exchanger, which would explain the um, poor performance reported in the dynamic lit uh, insulation literature. Um, I won't go into this graph, but I will say that we found this this saddle point of zero heat transfer between the, between the room and the surface, which is that point of, of thermal isolation um, uh, impinged by those incoming jets. So we, we, we demonstrated that there was this, this separation which we were able to explain the poor performance in the dynamic insulation literature, which is why we propose to um, heat the interior surface um, directly and treat the envelope properly as a heat exchanger. So why we integrated this vascular surface. So it tempers the uh, space radiantly and ensures good thermal contact with the incoming air. And remember, if the heat exchange surface is large, then the water doesn't need to be very hot or cold. It could be uh, tepid, and, and that, would, that, would, uh, that would suffice. So at the moment, there are two ways of achieving this vascular surface. You can uh, use standard hydronic uh, tubing, known as uh, in the industry as capillary tubing, made of polypropylene and the, the diameters of three to five millimeters. And they come in mats of standard sizes. And the water flows very slowly, so the pressure, pressure losses are, are low. And you can just plaster straight over them on any interior surface. Um, and this, this kind of technology is, is, is popular in, in Europe. Um, but for a better fit dimensionally and thermally, we manufactured our own uh, millifluidic panel, um, 
with collabor collaborators from the, the Wyss Institute. Um, so, and then we, we did it based on a, a method published um, for optimizing, this, again, the size and spacing of those channels um, to maximize the effectiveness of that vascular surface. Um, so um, we, we're at this point now where we've demonstrated the validity of that correlation and we're in this exciting moment where uh, we know that in principle we can apply this to any, any building material. Um, just to share with you some initial calculations of what that might mean, it seems like the lowest sort of hanging fruit is, is mass timber. Um, so for instance, a three-ply mass timber CLT panel um, drilled with the um, appropriate holes, you can see the dimensions there at the top, um, could get an effective U value um, at the same level or better than passive house. Right? and passive house being um, 50 centimeters thick with many different materials, we can get, get that equivalent performance with, with six centimeters and just one uh, material. So in, in the end, this is, this is the sort of, uh, I guess, promise of the breathing wall. It's these three abstract functions uh, combined into one material uh, structure. Um, and in any mental representation of a building as a technical artifact, these three abstract functions are normally separated analytically, um, and preferably so, right? And it's complicated. Uh, but with the breathing wall, we can now start to imagine integrating them into one uh, material structure. I say start because uh, there's a long way to go. Uh, to work properly, the breathing wall needs its building, its niche, to adapt. And we're not entirely sure how that should happen yet. Um, I said before that buildings as technical artifacts are a result of, of human actions, but not necessarily of human design. Um, so which begs the question, uh, what am I doing by proposing a, a new abstract schema? Um, well, I see myself as contributing to a larger process of discovery. So I'm searching for interdependencies and refinements, uh, tinkering, uh, with the potentialities present in the materials and processes uh, involved in a building, involved in a building, involved in building. And I see myself as contributing to this evolutionary process that progressively exploits the physicality of the architectural milieu. So I'm going to uh, stop now. I've got another section to talk to you about, uh, about buoyancy ventilation, if there's, if there's enough time. But I'd like to open up the floor to questions about the, the breathing wall uh, before you all fall asleep. <laughs> yes? Um, with the CLT panel wall you showed me, um, does this require the same surface heating system? Yes. Well, in that case, how would it be integrated into your process? Well, yes, yes, yes and no. So. Um, so we could do it. Um, we could do it the high tech way, uh, and the, the mid tech way, and the, the, the really low tech way. And the, mid, the high tech way is is we we make our own vascular surface, right? And and actually that's pretty straightforward. Like the uh, the recipe for that is is published, and like you get acrylic and you mill it and you 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 um, chemically sort of glue it you glue it together and and you can do it that way. Or you could, you know, mill channels for that um, capillary tubing to go in, right? And then have, you would need another plate over that, right? Okay, so another material. Or like the, the even lower tech way, which my collaborator Kilmo uh, prefers, he wants to explore first, is actually heat the surface radiantly from afar. So you can imagine like configuring that wall around the, uh, the radiator that heats the room. So that radiator is in direct uh, radiant contact with that surface and, and you have it that. So it would have be, be a naked wall in that, in that, in that sense. So if, is the heat in this situation um, through the wall being transferred? Is, is the air the medium of transfer? The air is the collector medium. So it's the thing that collects the air, but the, it, the material is the thing that is conveying the heat to the air. So, I guess, the more dynamically, is it, it's not transferring through radiation, like it's focusing on the air? No, it's, this is, yeah, it's an interaction through the material continuum 
and then which is captured by the air and then and then brought through by convection. But radiation may play a part on on the external and internal surfaces. So is the difference between like a, the, the effectiveness of a radiant wall versus the like airflow? I know a radiant panel is usually more effective than airflow, but is it that the amount of perforation in the wall? So here I'm here I'm I yeah I. I I wouldn't directly compare them. I would say that this is a, a, a kind of hybrid. So what I'm saying is like, let's combine the radiant surfaces um, with the air supply, right? And, and so, it's do, so you're, that surface is doing both. It's, ra it's tempering the room radiantly, but also preheating the, the incoming air. And you can imagine, uh, you know, not all the envelope has to be perforated, right? So you could imagine uh, the ideal thermodynamic labor where every surface is vascularized, let's say, and then only some portions of that are, are perforated to let, let air in, right? Uh, a couple of questions. So you mentioned that uh, external air pressure is sometimes used as the uh, means by which mm -hmm. to pressurize the wall yep. to have the air flow through it, um, but you can't really depend on that, I assume, um, in all circumstances. So what are the mechanisms by which... In, yeah, you're right. So um, in the second part, I'm going to show you... Uh, uh, a natural mechanism which I think you can depend on, uh, buoyancy ventilation. Um, the, the other form is, is wind pressure, but that's uh, very unlikely to be in an area of the world where that's sort of consistent and you can rely on, right? Um, the, other, the other means is, is by a fan. So like this, you know, this, this breathing wall could, could uh, integrate or liaise with its own kind of cluster duct, right? So like, uh, with, with heat recovery at the exhaust uh, as well. Um, but yeah, and something else I should mention which is sort of related to that, um, you know, uh, you, if, if this is external facing to, to the exterior, it's probably gonna need a rain screen or, or, or a wind screen, which, which may or may not be another material, which is sort of fine, but you, because wind could have deleterious effects like, like you know, oscillating suction and so forth. So you need to overcome that. But here, here I'm showing like this, this example which, where it's facing a courtyard and you can imagine like you could get over the deleterious effects of, of winds that way, you know, because it would be somewhat sheltered. Anyway, yeah. So are you suggesting that only 2.8 depth is enough? I'm suggesting that in this calculated example, again, like that correlation, I can, I can compute like any, any option I I, I can start from me. I can say, okay, I, I'm, I'm working with wood and uh, I, I'm, I'm constraining to a six centimeter thickness. What are the, what's the diameter of the holes? And that's what we've done. So, yeah, so the diameter there is, is 1.7 millimeters. The, the, depth, the depth there is 3 pi and that's, uh, it's not shown there, but that's uh, six centimeters. Yeah. So each ply is two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, and so all, all of those, all of those are sized to meet uh, the passive house standard of uh, U value of 0 0.15 watts per meter squared per, per degree Kelvin. But we, but we do it with different thicknesses, and that has implications in the size of the heat exchange of surface, which is the A, um, right? But also the amount of, of airflow coming through. It's 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 very tightly interdependent. Is that the point? Hi. Right, no, absolutely. Um, there are, and it's, it's all depends, it's, it's like the next stage of really fascinating tinkering for us. Um, so again, I'm, not, I'm sort of not positioning myself as a, a kind of product supplier innovator when to, to give this, you know, I'm, I'm as a sort of scientist designer tinkering with the fabric of material reality and, and just, you know, I want you to join in with me on, on this project, right? Um, it, so the, the moisture transfer could be really interesting. So with wood, so I think it gets around in most cases this problem of interstitial condensation. Yeah, because you don't have interstices, right? And um, the, uh, any moisture goes straight through the pores. It, I mean, it's more complicated than that, but it's something we have to investigate. And then depending on what material you use, there could be different um, potentials. So for example, with wood, 
that has natural moisture buffering uh, capacities. If, if the air is overly moist, it could, we could design it perhaps to absorb that moisture and then either get rid of it to the exterior when the time is right or use it for, I don't know, evaporative cooling to the interior on, on, a, on a dry summer's day. Good, good, good question. That's going to be that's a, like kind of a, a secondary factor for us to to try and get hold of. We think we're pretty sure, like just looking at the at the math, like whether it's whether whether the optimum, like the, the optimum, let's say for the diameter is is a is a it's not a sharp peak. It's quite a kind of flat plateau. So there's quite a lot of um, wiggle room, which is great. You know. Um, because it means, I mean, I love the idea in the low-tech version, like, you know, almost anyone could just go in and sort of drill this, right? Yeah. Probably yeah. missing it from some of these numbers, but the, the, uh, the density of these pores, like the spacing thing, what, how do you imagine these? How are they? Well, how it's, yeah, so let, let's... Uh, so can we imagine the material? Right, so let's look at these. The, these, these are, are, I think these are indicative. These samples. So, and that's range. a block of what dimension? That is 15 by 15 centimeters. Okay. Yeah, so these are, uh, I believe, two millimeter holes. Two millimeters. Yeah, so they're in the order of millimeters, and the spacing's in the order of centimeters. We would, we would imagine that as a building skin, like that as a texture on a building skin. Yeah, I mean, you might, you might not be able to reveal it on to the exterior. You might have to have that sort of cover. Yeah. But again, like this, this like. Potentials with that, like that rain screen or windscreen could be glass and that could be solar <coughs> harvesting on the external surface, so you could preheat that air with solar radiation as well. And yeah. Have you looked at other materials like you talked about these ones uh, and the mass conversion new one? I'm curious whether there's other materials that are inherently porous themselves that are having a drive stream is working on uh, sawdust and mycelium right. and the blocks, you know, which is Right. That's a great question. What we were what we were hoping for is that um, it wasn't clear to us exactly uh, what. It turns out that the the right scales of these diameters are in, in the order of millimeters, um, and we were hoping to find, say, a species of wood with with its um, phylum at that at that scale, so we could just like turn it that way and suck and just like ready made. Yeah. But it, it we we haven't found a species like that. Yet yeah, it's like they're in the tens of microns, uh, so just about an order of uh, magnitude out. Um, but what that means is that um, porosity, in the normal sense of of materials, is at an order of magnitude smaller than and actually affects the processes here. So, which is why we could use a a, a normally porous um, piece of wood. But you certainly the, the point is here is you can design uh, the porosity of your material. So, if you took your mycelium thing, you could have it grow around. Things that like evacuated channels or, or, or you know compressed sawdust around that. Yeah. All you need to know is just all you need to do is like measure the thermal conductivity beforehand, and, or look it up, and you you can work with that this correlation. That one there. So could you talk a little bit, a little bit more about the next row, the next slide? Yeah. Um, because I, I I find this very magical sense of like beyond my imagination um, because I can't help but think that heat is going to conduct through this material. You're going to have heat loss mm -hmm. through the material. So can you, I don't know whether it's helpful, but maybe for me to understand it better, I would like to understand better the relationship between the materials and how... Let, let's go back to this, this diagram and then we can go back to the, that other one. Yeah, so, um, so um, I, I gave a partial truth here, and I said, I said hot always, heat always travels from hot to cold, which is true. And then I said, all we need to do is suck through the air to reroute that heat to it, right? Um, but there's also another sort of parameter in that equation, which is uh, the rate of heat transfer at the surface. 
So what, what I'm doing by sucking the air through is like I've got, I've, I've got air at this coming in which begins at the same temperature as it is outside. Right, so that's that same temperature difference. So heat would want to follow in either of those to each either of those sinks, either outside or in, in the channel. But the, the, the channel gives more uh, um, uh, attraction power to the heat because you know it's rubbing up against the surface and creating more heat transfer uh, uh, exchange at the surface. So basically, by pulling that air through, I, I give yeah we can call it like that. We give uh, more attraction potential. Uh, to the channel than to the outdoors, so most of it gets rerouted. But you, ha you know, you have to find the right balance of, of geometry, spacing, and uh, to match the, the amount of heat going through and the, the conductivity of the material. And the Which movement, you have, to, you, have to, you have to maintain that air movement in order to work. If that air movement correct, then correct, 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 correct. That's important. Yeah. So I mean. Most engineers in dynamic research, dynamic insulation research, have assumed a priori that it that it needs mechanical fans pulling it through. I'm I'm interested in using buoyancy uh, um, ventilation as a as a natural means of, of pulling it through. So that's more fun. So it sounds like we need to hear part two. <laughs> All right. We can't leave us hanging here. Right. Okay. Try and combine it. Did that help answer your question, Adrian? About that, right? Okay, it's fine. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I want to give one more um, example of this, uh, what I'm calling emergent process of tinkering and discovering that architects and engineers around the world are part of, or, or you should be part of. Um, so it's the evolution, the technical evolution of, of natural ventilation schemes, from wind-driven ventilation. Uh, to buoyancy ventilation. So here are those shadowy Shrelin images, again of of heat emanating, of of people and and affecting the bath that you're all submerged in. Okay. And to understand buoyancy ventilation, you must change your imagination and realize that you are submerged at the bottom of a sea of air, called a thin layer called the atmosphere. You're not in empty space despite what your poche drawings suggest. And, yeah. So ventilation is about flushing the stale air out while maintaining a certain temperature. And we can do this mechanically with fans or naturally with the wind, or by using another driving force, which is buoyancy. And buoyancy is ventilation powered by waste heat from computers, people, light, and so on. And the reason why it is special is because it operates on a natural feedback loop. So the more people there are, the more ventilation you need, on the one hand. And on the other hand, the more people there are, the more excess heat you have with which to power the flow. Okay. And if you are able to harness that feedback mechanism, um, engineers are realizing, some engineers are realizing that uh, the, the technical design of, of buildings can be greatly uh, simplified so they become less dependent on the, on the cluster duct. Um, so buoyancy ventilation is really the art of, of emptying a filling box. And researchers have found that uh, sometimes the best way to simulate buoyancy ventilation is to make a scaled-down physical model replacing air with water. Okay, and then you account for the differences in physical properties between air and water and reach the same level of what they call dynamic similarity between the model and the, the real scale building. And then you know the patterns of fluid movement are directly representative of what happens in the real thing. Um, so here's one like really basic early model. These, these started to occur through the in the 90s. Uh, a really simple one. So there's a, a heating element in here, uh, fed by electricity, and that's producing heat. These are just um, temperature probes measuring the change of temperature. And what you notice here with the ink is that uh, the heat causes the fluid to rise and it exits out of the top there. It's a consistent stream. And then um, what, what, what goes out has to come in, so a consistent amount of fresh air also comes in at the bottom. All right, that's, that's a point of view. Okay, okay, right, that's better there. Uh, thanks. Okay, so that's the basic uh, premise, and the idea is that, um, well, if you know the height of the building and you know how much heat load you, you got in uh, and how much ventilation you need and what temperature you need to keep, keep out, 
then you can just like play with the sizes of the openings or the height of the building until you've re reached a sweet spot. Okay. So in principle, buoyancy ventilation is, is more reliable than wind ventilation um, because when you need it, uh, the wind might not be available, right? Um, but with buoyancy, the more occupants you have, the more power you have to generate the flow. So the power source and the demand are one and the same thing. They're directly coupled. So um, architectural practices like my previous employer, Foster and uh, Partners, uh, were starting to recognize this. And luckily enough, I was involved in the last two projects. But you, I, just note this sort of general change where the Commerce Bank in, in Frankfurt, which was branded by Foster as the first, world's first ecological tower, it was really based on this idea of offices surrounding a central atrium which gave occupants access to openable windows, uh, side ventilation. Um, more really um, about the labor laws in Frankfurt at that time. Uh, insisting that you, uh, occupants needed to be near openable windows than anything else. So that was a primary driver. Then you have the Swiss Re in London, um, which is a sort of mashup, um, a complicated mashup of wind ventilation and buoyancy ventilation. So you have the external form, uh, which is, accelerates the wind as it, as it passes round, which creates suction points at the back end through which the air can be pulled through. But then you have also had these stacked atria which spiral around the building sort of six floors high which can allow that give it that kind of that chimney to be able the heat to rise up exit out and suck through fresh air from the other side um, and then you have these two projects which um, are based only on on buoyancy ventilation all right uh, and i'm going to explain one of them how one of them works or, or will work um, apple campus in cupertino under construction uh, well, that's partly um, occupied now. All right, so here's, um, here's a colorful fluid dynamics image of, um, of how the ventilation system uh, works. But this sort of, I guess, privileges the, the external effect of, of wind more than anything else. It doesn't really tell us what, what is actually happening. Um, this is what is actually happening in, in more simple ways. So this is, um, you have a central chimney um, connected to an open plan uh, sort of corridor, communal area, and these cellular offices. So there's, there's open space breakout areas in these, and then you've got, say, engineers tinkering away, uh, two in each, each cell there. And the idea is that they generate heat which heats up the air locally, and then that heat um, wants to go up and escape, so it escapes out the chimney, kind of like a hot air balloon, and rises up, and then that creates a suction force which pull, pulls in fresh air from uh, the sites. Okay? Looking in plan, um, you see this, uh, you have the, uh, the, the chimney sort of split down the middle, ser serving, uh, serving opposite um, cells, let's call them, so you pull in fresh air from both sides, and the important thing is here, with wind-driven ventilation, you're normally limited to the plan depth. You know, it can't be too deep, but here with buoyancy ventilation, you can get really deep. Um, and then you have an important, another important aspect here is, is this circulation zone, which is defined as a kind of um, semi-interior um, semi space. So, they are not too worried that the conditions are, are not perfect here. It's really a space for, it's space for circulation, first and foremost, so the expectations are, are not the same as if they were in an office space, so they're a bit freer in that respect. And also, it's an opportunity for pre-tempering the air if it's a bit too cold or a bit too warm. So I worked on, the, uh, on integrating water pipes into these very white uh, concrete slabs so that the air could be pre-cooled or preheated before it actually entered in. So notice here, you've got to imagine this as like a kind of tug of war. It's not pushing from the outside, it's being pulled from inside. That's a, that's the, that's a big difference between buoyancy ventilation and, and wind-driven ventilation. Uh, the other interesting thing is um, it completely changes the notion of, of performance. This building will not get uh, lead platinum because it has single glazed windows, which do not have the requisite U-value. Um, but in terms of the energy balance of the building, that doesn't matter. 
um, because this, you bring fresh air directly in. Um, we're not bothered about keeping a big temperature difference between inside and outside here, because that's our inside space. We're pre-tempering it. Um, so it's just different. <laughs> yeah. What is the next boundary there? Is that a diffuser up there? This one? Yeah. That would be a, a, a place for a partition, and then you still allow, it still has a space like this detail here for fresh air to come over it and be pulled through. Um, so here is, um, here is, uh, here are acoustic dampers here. Or, or, and also can they control the, um, the flow rate. So that can be throttled. Would you think about saying having glass in this kind of water? Sorry? I mean, they did the question of also the climate. Yeah, yeah, it sort of, it doesn't matter. It's like, um, uh, you know, it's like our big, how do you, yeah, so we're not, we're not um, heating that space, really. We're, we're heating the, the air. It's coming in. It's not escaping out. So the heat doesn't sort of escape out in a normal way. Right? We're bringing it sort of straight in. Yeah? So it doesn't, no, it doesn't matter that you have like a thick envelope anymore. So this, this is important. It'll probably come up in the, in the session later in the afternoon. One way of getting rid of the construction one way of challenging the constraints of, of envelope and thermal performance is getting rid of this frankly strange notion of rigidly, of interior and exterior, as if there's like, there has to be a, a, a sharp threshold. Um, especially in, in warmer climates where there's a, like a richer social history of, of, of um, a continuum of, of spaces, you know, or nested spaces. Um, and that's, I think, more, appro make, uh, more appropriate, certainly for, for warmer climates, but it also can be used uh, in climates like, like this. So, the climate of the, uh, like in the UK versus, say, here, where you know, there's this incredible dynamic between you know, kind of 35 degree days in summer and minus yeah. 20 or 30 degrees in winter, so you get the, the most fluctuation in any kind of highly populated area. Yeah. I, I think, um, and this is speculative, um, and we don't have enough examples, really, and, um, but I think if, if this is, if, if, if Cupertino um, allows or, um, an onion of one layer thick, then more extreme climates need more layers. So, so like Toronto would, I don't know how, know how many layers, but many. To be able, and so you'd have, go from the internal part of the onion, which is, you know, like the, the ideal, like gradually going out. And then, and then the question is, like, well, what architecture program or social things can we host in each of those layers? Like, why, why, uh, why have we convinced ourselves with this normative, everything that we do has to be at this indifferent comfort temperature? It's, it's sort of crazy. Um, Okay, anyway, so um, the theory and methods to properly design buoyancy ventilation um, properly um, are, are fairly new. They've, uh, they've been developed since the, the 90s. Like, there's a history that goes back to, uh, to the 19th century, but really, like, the, the, the physics is only being started to, to crack, uh, is only being cracked now, and most, the guys behind it are mostly this network of, of Building scientists um, coming out of the um, Cambridge University mostly. Um, so their work has led to some breakthroughs in, in buoyancy ventilation design. Um, so they've developed methods published that allow engineers and designers like me to solve problems that were previously intractable, uh, at least in the hustle and bustle of a, of a live project. And what, one of those um, problems um, that we didn't know how to resolve was um, the problem of multi-story uh, buoyancy ventilation. Okay, so the the pulling power of buoyancy is 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 proportional to the height of the of the stack. All right, how um, or, or how far your floor away is from the, the top of the chimney where it's or, or, or the stack where it's exhausting out. Um, so if you have a multi-story building, you want probably to give everyone on each floor their fair share of fresh air and temperature, right? It's not fair that the people at the lower end, say, get more fresh air because there's more sucking power than the people at the top uh, end. But it, 
but, uh, it wasn't known previously about how to like uh, throttle the openings at each level so that everybody got their fair share of fresh air. But now we know how to do that, um, and this app is uh, an expression of, of a recent paper, um, and, I, and, I, and I wrote this, and it just shows uh, this app, and it shows like uh, what size opening windows you should have on each floor, depending on like how many people you have uh, per story, uh, how much heat load there is per person, including their heat, but also computers, etc., la la la, and the number of stories. And then there's, you see that bar; it's like it's showing. And, oh, and there's that um, there's that dial there showing like how much fresh air per person uh, you will achieve uh, with that set of parameters. And then what is the temperature difference between interior and out exterior that you will achieve? So. For buoyancy ventilation to work upwards, it has to be warmer out inside than it is outdoors, right? It has to, you have to have a, yes? Is that a little I could share it. I could share it. Um, but you have to read the paper. Um, so I'm going to share with you a project that I'm working on uh, where we are trying to use that knowledge um, in, a, in a real building. So this is um, a, a collaboration with the Department of Urban Planning in Medellin, uh, Colombia. I did, um, I did um, a workshop with them through Harvard Executive Education, provocatively entitled something like um, Medellin doesn't need air conditioning. All right, Medellin without the cluster duct. I can't remember exactly. We did a couple of workshops and then um, they posited to me that they wanted to do a new office building for their urban planners and architects and that we should do it based on these principles of buoyancy ventilation so we don't um, need air conditioning. Um, so let me give you a bit of context about Medellin, uh, Colombia. It's, it's in, in a valley near the equator. They call it the Eternal Spring. Um, our, our site is just there in the, in the, down in that valley. And this is where I'm getting the weather data from. Um, so wind follows down the, the line of that valley, um, but it's generally speaking two week, 40%, approximately 40% of the time, which is why more and more air conditioning is being taken up uh, in the city. All right. Um, the mean temperature, by the way, is 24 degrees Celsius, and it, and it like, goes down to about 16 degrees Celsius at night and then on average about 29 Celsius, 30 degrees uh, during the day. All right, so there's a nice temperature differential. So uh, the alternative to wind um, ventilation is to use buoyancy to power it, okay? So this is how it, how it works, very simple with this model to explain. Um, so you have these uh, multiple floors, all fed by a, a, a sink connected to this single uh, chimney. And like, here's an early plan a rough idea of what's happening here. So this is uh, an office space here. They'll have these, these cells here, and that's the, the chimney there, and this open area here. And the idea in this just like quick sketch over a, a Skype, you know, I, I work, you know, I work on this uh, on my Sunday afternoons, sort of pro bono, uh, so it's fast, <laughs> or, um, and it's not, uh, well, it's not, it's not polished, let's say that. So. Um, the idea is that the, the heat from people, computers, etc., rises up the chimney and then sucks through fresh air from the openings uh, on the side. Okay. Uh, and our idea is that, our proposition is that uh, it works on buoyancy for 40% uh, of the year when there's sort of no wind. Then there's this middle point of the year where there is some wind, but then we've aligned it to that uh, wind orientation so they, they work in harmony. Uh, and then there's 30% of the year when uh, wind is strong enough so that it like, overcomes the strength of buoyancy and, and it dominates. But still, the uh, openings should allow that, that ventilation to happen. So it's, it's almost, it's almost uh, finished here. This is the, the, the concrete structure finished and then this uh, GRC uh, facade for shading on the outside. Okay, so we've designed the chimney and the openings on each floor so that each person uh, will get 30 liters per second of fresh air, um, 30 liters per second of fresh air, which is three times more than they would normally get in an air-conditioned uh, building, right, um, than the standard. And we're doing that with a temperature difference of two degrees. So it, the air temperature is two degrees warmer in the inside than, than the outside. 
Um, right? So we need that two degree temperature difference to drive the flow, but uh, the question arises about the thermal comfort, especially in the hotter periods during the day. So more often than not, it, as I said, it reaches 29 degrees Celsius outdoors in the afternoon, which means that the air temperature inside will be 31 degrees Celsius. Right? Now, intuitively, that sounds too hot, um, but there is a new thermal comfort standard for naturally ventilated buildings. Uh, and the core of this here is that after extensive field studies, uh, the authors of this standard uh, came to the sort of radical conclusion that people's notion of comfort depends on the climate and the pattern of weather in the preceding week weeks. Hence, it's called the adaptive uh, comfort standard. And the way, briefly, it works is like this. Instead of like a definitive window, you get a, a moving threshold, depending on, on, on the climate patterns in the, in the previous week. And it's based on the average temperature of that day and here of, of, of this, that preceding period. And usually in Medellin, that's 24 degrees. So it tells us that at 24 degrees, um, the, I, the majority of people will be comfortable um, if the interior conditions are at 20, up to 29 degrees Celsius. So it gives me a five degree uh, extra to sort of work with, right? Or a few degrees cooler to work with, yeah? But that, 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 th that window uh, changes as the average uh, moves from, from left to right, okay? Um, so that's good, um, but not good enough, right? We still have that 29 degrees Celsius puts us at the average of the exterior, but not what it will be in the interior, 31 degrees, right? Um, so how do we make that up? Um, well, we do that by recognizing that our notion of temperature is much more, our felt notion of temperature is much more complex than we'd like to imagine. It's made up of a composite of different heat flows. And if you understand those heat flows in and out of the body and the skin, you can sort of manipulate or trick people into thinking they are cooler than, than the surrounding air bath actually is. So there is convection, which is connected to the air temperature. There's evaporation, which is connected to the wet bulb temperature. But there's also infrared radiation, uh, the uh, effect of rates of cooling due to uh, cold surfaces on heavy mass walls, for example, or vascular surfaces. Right? And they all combine to a sort of felt temperature. So with that, cool, that, hot, that big diurnal shift and the, the, cold, the cool temperature of 16 degrees at night that occurs regularly, we can reliably cool down the exposed thermal mass in the structure and view through a uh, thermal camera, we see that its, uh, its temperature is, is surface, the surface temperature is colder. And what that means is this guy here, it might be me, is um, radiating his heat to that cold surface and, and obtaining a feeling of cooling sensation with that, right? So if you've been to a heavy mass church in, in Europe, an old heavy mass church in Europe, you would have felt this effect. It feels cooler inside, even though the air temperature, actually, if you measured it, is the same as outside. It's that cold, there's cold surfaces absorbing your radiant heat, traveling at the speed of light via electromagnetic radiation. Right. So the other thing we do is to give the ventilation a solar boost in the hottest part of the day. So here is the, here is the solar path during the day from morning to night. And we locate the, the chimney on, on this facade, uh, partially disguised by here. It's just a sort of glass chimney. But then the idea is that when the sun hits that, we go from 30 liters per second to 40 liters per second per person with that extra heat in the chimney. All right, that, and that, that, in terms of felt temperature and air movement, buys us back an extra degree. Right. Uh, so uh, like, perhaps my favorite element of the project, which probably, uh, knowing recent meetings, it's not gonna happen, but uh, still I, I tried to propose it, is the idea of like, uh, delegating the function of a building management system to the occupants themselves, um, which I was v uh, vouching for for a simple reason. Uh, these guys are the architects and urban planners of the city of Medellin. And if anyone should understand buoyancy ventilation intimately, it's, it's these guys. And the best way probably to understand that is to be part of the machine itself. Right? So our, um, our idea was that you'd have simple graphical displays on each window showing that depending on how much people there are in that office space, 
that morning, you open it up by X, right? And those, and those graphics slightly change on each level. Okay. Um, so we see this as a kind of more, a, a laboratory, and our idea is to broadcast the performance of, of the, uh, the building um, live on the internet, uh, warts and all. Um, because we have a problem in our industry, which is the lack of a feedback loop between things as they are built and uh, things as they actually perform. And the block really has to do with the competencies that uh, companies have to display outwardly to clients, right? Um, I'm not, um, I don't have that issue now that I'm an academic. Um, I can just set up um, a well-designed experiment, right? I don't have to show, uh, purport to any sort of competencies about how this uh, should excellently perform. I want to know how this machine actually works. Okay. So to conclude, if we want to dissolve the cluster duct away, we must stop treating all this technology as a, a black box and recognize that the cluster duct is a manifestation of analytical separations, separations that do not necessarily correspond with the physical potential of the cluster duct's niches, its environmental niches. What I mean by that is, future versions of the cluster duct will display greater interdependency of functions and processes. And this interdependency should reveal, as much as it reflects, the structures of the physical world as they are inherent in the architectural milieu. Thanks very much. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a good question. I, I don't know. I tend to think that um, the opportunities for, therm let's call it thermodynamic um, reciprocity, like, or just symbiosis, um, are easier as things scale up and program becomes more, more complex and spaces get larger. You know, so you can have, you can have room for those uh, that in, in interior condition, semi-interior, semi-exterior, and, and exterior condition, and you can sort of play with that. And there are different, and there are different activities happening inside the building. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. We're going to try. We're going to try testing um, the breathing wall at a sort of cabin scale, um, and it may be simply just doing it in mass timber, having one wall, and then sticking a, a, a chimney on the top of it with a sufficient height to demonstrate that it works. So it could, could work at that level. Because, I mean, there was a time before air conditioning that there were, there were components that were fairly conventional in the building. Yeah. In a, resident, yeah, yeah. In a residential building, you know, that I say. Or, yeah. or even in an office building, former office buildings became sort of open plan. Yeah. Right? There were a right. series of separate, separate offices with doors, right? You know, and, and there were devices that used to exist, like the double hung window. Right, right, right. right? You know, and the transom window right. over a door, right? Go to a hallway, and then the hallway yep. led to a stairwell. Or which was doing lots of things, as well as, yeah, the stairwell, which was doing lots of things, like light and air at sometimes, yeah. 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 And we've lost a lot right. of those devices in, in, the, in the process. Well, devices, but also um, knowledge, I think, and understanding of, of what those devices were actually orchestrating and so we've just I don't know it's if I put my designer hat on we've we've delegated that responsibility to to specialists mm -hmm. I would say and we so we no longer so we treat them as black boxes now and so we're no longer in control of them I would say yeah, and, and, and I think that's where the the cluster duck arises mm -hmm. yeah if you're dealing with so you have buoyancy and wind, and, and I'm just concerned about like all the wind rushing through the building. And I know you, you said it's three times the air movement as air conditioning, but not necessarily velocity. Yeah, not, no, just, just bulk flow. Yeah. yeah, how do you, so when, when you move from, buoyancy seems relatively easy to control if you can control temperature differential. But 
if you're mixing that with wind, how do you modulate wind, the speed of airflow? Right. You just have to adjust it. Yeah, I mean, like it just you 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 know you you look at the wind data and you see how what that risk is, and then you make a call. Like, like the the um, the engineers on on this project have made a call that uh, that's one of the reasons why they should probably go for a, a building management system to to uh, automatically control the louvers. So if if there is a strong wind, you know, just there's a bit right, but um, any wind is great there. Like it's just. Often, you know. But there are those moments, yeah, that you have to sort of close, yeah. With uh, something like Commerce Bank, you were interested to hear you say that it was more to do with the kind of uh, the rights of the workers to have kind of operable. That started things, yeah. And yeah. the, but, but I mean, there's a, in that kind of thing with, uh, with 60 stories, as I recall, it's, yeah. it's a, the, the exact effect, the flu must be hugely high velocity. Actually, no, because um, interestingly, um, it's too open at the top and the bottom to sustain, oh, to sustain any uh, temperature difference with the outside. Yeah. So, and so that was consciously done to, to stop it from being a kind of hurricane? No, I don't think it was consciously. I think this was done sort of before, I don't know, like, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I don't know, when, when you work in, when you work in, when you work in uh, large architectural practices, or work for engineering consultants who are one of many actors in a, in a large project, um, you realize that decision making, making happens rather like a, more as a kind of ecology of decisions, makings, rather than you know, a single authorship. So there, perhaps there were some engineers who were purporting that, but that's not necessarily why. That doesn't necess you can't necessarily tie that down to the genesis of, of the idea, I would say. I mean, everyone wants to everyone wants to explain a building neatly. Like this is why it sort of happened in that as a sort of serial genesis of ideas. But but that's not to say that like you can't get really good architects who can't um, who don't propose a um, a coherent concept that carries carries its way through uh, the whole process. Are there potential issues with quality measures that means like noise or pollution? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, this whole thing with interior exterior, isn't it? Uh, so in, in, in Medellin, okay, like my, my cheeky catchphrase, like is for the city planners of Medellin was you can't, because this question always came up, so that there's a lot of traffic in downtown Medellin. Um, you can't have breathing buildings without breathing cities. So we would orient, oriented the, um, the intakes mostly towards the park and the areas that are, are going to be pedestrianized. Um, but noise may be an issue, and, and pollution in the beginning may be an issue. It's something we, uh, we, we need to monitor. Yeah. But this, whole, this area is, is planned to be pedestrianized, and this, this uh, park will be sort of aggrandized. I mean, some questions that you you might start thinking about in Toronto. This is a, this is a cold. Uh, this is a, a warm place. But like, what about cold climates? Um, well, as long as you have spaces for for preheating or machines to mix fresh air as it's coming in, to add it, then you can you can um, do buoyancy ventilation in when it's below 10 degrees Celsius outside, like it's not a problem. And, and in some circumstances, you could even go colder, right? So probably not all year round in Toronto, but some areas of the building, uh, maybe for significant portions of the year. Especially if you're less concerned about hitting like the sweet spot of 21 degrees Celsius, depending on what's actually happening in those spaces. Can you see that system now? Can you see that there's that, there's that potentiality. That the, the, one of the attractive things about mass timber is that it, it could be everything that the envelope and structure and services do in, in one material. That's certainly a, a, an ambition. Um, and then, and then uh, I think an important thing to add to that is um, 
you know, it's licensed under Creative Commons Commons license. So it's not it's not something that we that we're patenting, right? It it's something that you know. There's like um, I, the industry, I think, needs sort of uh, adaptive adaptable configurations of standard materials that can be applied with a sort of global recipe, right? You can, you can apply it with your local materials to your local environmental conditions, to your project contingency. So I see it as more as a sort of open recipe book um, that uh, idealistically a, a community of, of makers and designers sort of contribute towards across the world. Where do you think the, the notion that we need to kind of separate things, like structure, insulation, uh, I think it's a good question, and I'm trying to un unwrap it ourselves. Um, uh, I think it's partly to do with uh, the conditions that the technology uh, enforces on its niches. You know, so the, uh, an efficient air conditioning system slash cluster duct needs needs a interior and exterior area to be thermally separated and isolated, right? And then it's partly about the economic and uh, conditions of, and the social conditions of the materials and knowledge supply chain, which is very fragmented at the moment uh, too. Um, so like to, this, to, to the point where we have this envelope, you know, it's like, oh, we had, we used to have, to go back to your point, we had mass envelopes, and then we had uh, HVAC, which demanded more of the envelope. So um, a material supply came in, and hey, I've got this new material called, called insulation, let's put it on. That created a problem with interstitial condensation. So there's another material, so DuPont come along and say, hey, we've got this like moisture barrier, and it's this sort of addition of stuff to um, resolve problems that the uh, reciprocal adaptation creates. In terms of the system, like going back to the um, how are you able to optimize the velocity to the Right, so um, you, it, it's hard to answer that question without going into the uh, like mechanics of the equation. Um, so I'm going to. Um, so you see there's a, there's, a, there's a temperature difference there in the, in, in the equation, the delta T between indoors and, and outdoors. Uh, but it's been normalized against the, the, the heat flow going through the material, the depth of the material, and the conductivity of the material. So it gives you, a, actually it gives you a ratio, which is a sort of a heat recovery ratio, let's say. And I can adapt this uh, to whatever I want. Like, and that's the pressure across and the porosity and uh, the conductivity and the conductivity of uh, the material. So what actually happens is that I can, I can size the system to, for example, have a um, hit a dynamic Q value or, or a ratio of heat recovery that remains the same despite the, the, the fluctuations in exterior temperature. So the ratio of heat recovered remains the same, but you know the the, the overall heat lot, like the overall heat exchange increases. And then there are elements of control, like for instance, maybe I could throttle the, the rate of incoming air, either with a fan or I do something with the chimney, like open it up a bit more at the top. So there's those kinds of things. Um, you could actually control the whole system in principle just by the heat of the water going into the vasculature and it's flow rate. Because if I heat that, that would give more buoyancy, give more suction pressure, or like, yeah, so it's very interdependent. So the answer to your question is the parameters are there, but it's not clear on the best way of doing it. And the best way of doing that may vary in different uh, situations. Regarding the energy efficiency of the system, so how efficient do you Sometimes, think not necessarily wind, but yeah. Yeah, how efficient do you think the system will be? Because every time um, you have to heat up the system and heat up the air for 
You, you, like, so, uh, the word efficiency is problematic because uh, it's difficult to compare efficiencies of, of different systems of different technical lineages. Um, and um, so, and to an, at a certain level, it becomes sort of meaningless doing that. So, you have to spend energy, you have to input energy in your system to to orchestrate the phenomena that you want to happen. And, like, and hopefully you get this reciprocation and it can become somewhat self-regulating and with the feedback processes and, and it's working off minimal in energy input. But there's also the question of not just energy as an abstract quantity, but the source of that energy. Right? So I, I could have a, an efficiently running uh, air conditioning system, but it's still um, connected to a grid uh, which are burning fossil fuels. Right, but what I think this might help us to do is to become less uh, reliant on fossil fuels, I think. So, which, because if you have larger heat exchangers, you don't need such warm water or such cold water to sort of regulate the temperature. You can have it more at, at tepid water, so you can more readily use energy from the ground when it's available or build heat from the sun. So I'm, more, I'm not aiming for an abstract quantity of efficiency, I'm more I'm more aiming for a sort of a weaning off fossil fuels based on thermodynamic principles. Another question for creating for one game. Um, in terms of electrical systems for lights and so forth, you kind of see that combined with the green wall. Is there, does the green wall have to go through the entire wall assembly, or is there well, is that combined? I'm not, I've not thought about it, but I mean, Lights, unless they're incredibly efficient LEDs, would have a heat output that is useful in terms of heating. You could, why not integrate heat, like lighting into the system so the heat from those lights is contributing to the heating at that surface, for instance? What do you think? <laughs> I was, I was, it was more of a question where you put outlets on it. Like, oh, okay. Put an extra layer on it. Like, like, I, like I said, like I don't think all the wall is perforated. You know, I mean, like sim it's it's something that could be with mass timber, like panelized, and okay, so that you have the the services panel, like for instance, like next door, or or, or why not integrate it as well? But um, yeah, I don't think that's beyond the wit of man. Human.